registration for the Hackfest. We can start with that. Um, can I see the agenda again? Yep. Thanks. Um, okay, so morning, everybody. Afternoon, good evening. Um, so on the agenda today, we have our um, uh, update on the Hackfest. We have uh, finalized everything and the registration is up. Um, uh, we are going to cancel the November 9th meeting because that conflicts with the Hyperledger Member Summit where many of us are going to be in Singapore. Um, uh, and um, uh, so we are going to cancel the 9th, which means we actually have to move. Um, I think it was the composer um, uh, update um, uh, to, to, and we'll probably double that up on the 16th. Um, we have a proposal um, uh, that was sent out to the mailing list for Project Cicero. Um, is somebody going to be on to, to discuss that? Yeah. Hi, this is Human Shadab. I'm happy to yeah, discuss Okay, great. Thanks. Um, yeah. Uh, we have the training and education working group proposal that we discussed in the past and now that uh, Tracy is hopefully back from her travels, we can resume the discussion. And then finally, we have project reporting from the Sawtooth project. And next week will be Aroha. So any other items for the agenda? If not, OK, Todd, why don't we kick it off? All right, sounds good. Uh, Hackfest is finalized December 5th and 6th in Lisbon. I am dropping the registration link into the chat window right now. Uh, thank you for your patience in uh, while we were getting that sorted out. Uh, we are excited to see everyone there for the, the final Hackfest of the year. Uh, and as always, we have a draft agenda, so dropping the link in uh, as well. If there are topics you want to see get covered, things you want to hack on, discussions you want to have, uh, Etc. Please drop those topics into the agenda. We'll sort that out in unconference format on the beginning of day one of the Hackfest. Any and go ahead. Chris. Just as a reminder, I think again we're we're trending. We want to trend towards more hacking, less yakking. But uh, we recognize that there is there is a need, so we're probably going to try and and um, and do the you know the morning might be yakking and the afternoon hacking or vice versa. We'll see how things go. Sounds good. Uh, any questions on Lisbon Hackfest? All right, sounds good. Okay. So, and again, we we're going to cancel the ninth uh, Thursday, the ninth, because of the member summit. Um, okay. So I next up, right. Jonathan, what was that? Yeah, no, I th I think the town has already uh, canceled it, right? Uh, there was. Like yesterday. Yeah, I, I, I canceled out the meeting invite, more just a heads up so people uh, that may have not been subscribed on that Cal invite. Gotcha. Okay, Kumar, do you want to um, go over the uh, Cicero proposal? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for the opportunity here. Basically, we recently, um, we recently um, Submitted a proposal for um, Cicero, which is uh, on a very high level, um, a, a technology it's supposed to be a hyperledger, hyperledger project, a top level project, and whose purpose is to uh, make basically executable smart legal contracts. And it basically will be a open source implementation of. Uh, the Accord protocol, which is a protocol for the, the legal aspects of, again, smart contracts um, that we are uh, developing here at the Accord project. I'm happy to go into more detail, um, but that's just the sort of, uh, I guess, introduction. Sure, you, so, you want I mean, to this is all more about the. Me, uh, one at a time. So I think you were first. Okay. So I'll jump in. So the the protocol. Where is it? Because I've kind of tried to follow links and I go through the Accord project website. And is there a draft somewhere, or what's the status? 
yeah, the, the, the protocol uh, status itself uh, is in development. And but there the, isn't a draft you can point us to? Uh, at the moment, we have, um, you know, we, we do have, we have, we have code and draft we can point you to. We have some links that are provided um, in the proposal. Um, I can follow up with you on that aspect. Yeah, because I mean, obviously, you know, you say, hey, let's implement this protocol. If we don't know what the protocol is like, it's a bit difficult to judge. I mean, okay. on on the surface, sounds like a good idea. And, you know, it's something we're not quite, it's a higher level of the kind of things we've been doing so far, from what I understand, which sounds interesting. But I would like to see a little bit, because otherwise, and, and I don't know what the plan really is. Is there some kind of, you know, you're implementing and developing the standard those protocol at the same time in parallel or is one before the other in case of conflict which one prevails that's the kind of question i'm trying to get to sure the stand i mean the the protocol is meant to implement the standards but um yeah i can provide you with more detail so uh in that respect as well that would be useful thank you yeah, it's a similar comment for me, uh, Jonathan. Um, basically, it's going to be very interesting to see, uh, actually crucial to see, how can we use it, reuse it, how useful it is, and kind of what is the initial or immediate utilization of such a project, right? It's very clear to me what Composer does. It's very clear to me what, you know, uh, Cello does. So maybe something like that, that we can show, hey, you know, there will be like, a lot of legally binding contracts that people can use and we have a stack and some stuff that is kind of ready to go, a tanky solution. You can just use the code protocol and with this implementation, all the kind of blockchain smart contracts can not, like won't need to reinvent the wheel, right? So uh, just to understand the utility of this or, or how, what, what's the added value for, for, for the entire Hyperledger project? In, in, in that context. Hi, this is uh, Vipin. Um, Oman, um, you know, I, I have, I was at the Accord uh, project to launch and I spoke on behalf of Hyperledger over there. Um, but we, we do know that there are a couple of existing initiatives in this, uh, in this space. One is the ISDA initiative for the swaps. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how far they have come in terms of defining a, a, pro, a, a protocol itself, uh, but they have been working on this for for a while. And then there's of course uh, Lee Brain's uh, work in this uh, area. And then there are other people who are working like, I think there is um, another project uh, incubated inside uh, MIT's W3C or something like that, which is working on this as well. So it might be useful to um, uh, build up this common ground using all these initiatives that are aiming to do something similar. Yeah, that certainly is a goal of ours, is not to uh, create another splinter modeling language or, or approach. Um, I suspect, you know, our, our approach is to be a bit more higher level than those. So it wouldn't necessarily, um, like those approaches, at least the ISDAs one that I'm familiar with, uh, be tied to a, a specific domain such as derivatives. But, but we can clarify that as well, certainly. So can I just ask a high order question on this? Um, and, and I just saw the proposal yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to go through it in any detail yet. But um, what is it? Um, is it a module? Is your expectation this is a module that others would plug into existing ledgers? Um, is it um, a standalone system? Um, sorry. Um, That's a truck. But, yeah, that was a that was a, actually it was a bus, but yeah. <laughs> so what is it? Yeah, it, it is it's um it is a Molly language or a module that could be plugged into other systems, or you know if you I guess you could describe it as others would plug into this, but it it it, it includes uh, the legal specific um, 
aspects of a language that captures uh, smart contract uh, smart contract activities or or the execution of scripts that relate to the terms and conditions of sort of contracts, generally speaking. It's like a, a higher level so it, it adds, um, that, yeah. would, that, that would then compile down to um, chain code uh, or, or other you know, uh, implementation specific smart contract language. Right. Okay. Well, that was going to be my next question. How is the mapping done? Do you anticipate this is like a one-time translation and then you run this like in the native smart contract type of thing? Or do you expect this to be driving the smart contract mechanism of the, the framework you're building on? I don't, I don't think it's necessarily tied to either, but it would be generally a one-time sort of uh, compilation down to a particular... Uh, reference architecture or implementation. Okay. I like to call out to Composer and the fact that um, Dan um, from Composer is is uh, uh, throwing in this. Oh wait, is he also the CTO for Klaus? For Klaus, sorry. Yes. Dan Salmon. Right. Um, Dan. So, okay, so there's a a close tie to Hyperledger Composer, but not exclusive. It looks like. You know, it just uh, this is a way of boot, helping bootstrap. That's correct. Hi, this is uh, Gert from from Tradeshift. Um, super interesting. Um, you know, uh, to 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 be working with with formalizing uh, legal contracts. Um, a question about the accord. Um, uh, kind of organization. Um, so the protocol to be um, to be created there, it, it, it was not clear to me how how it will be created. You know what what's the opportunities for participation? You know what what is what is the governance around this uh, the the accord effort? Just just in a few yeah. words. Sure, the, the accord project is a is a nonprofit uh, organization, a consortium where you know, it's a membership organization. Where we are incorporating, uh, it's quite open to incorporate the views of a variety of uh, members and types of stakeholders, from lawyers to technologists. So all, all their, all that type of uh, participation would feed into the protocol ultimately. Hi, this is Bahua. Uh, let me ask a question. So, uh, Technically, is there any special requirement to implement a legal uh, contract using a blockchain smart contract? So uh, what, what's the major technical challenge there? Can you clarify what you mean by requirements? I mean, uh, we know we can implement, implement uh, those business contracts uh, among um, various uh, scenarios. So I'm not I'm not familiar with those uh, legal contracts. So I want to know if there's some uh, special demand. Yeah, certainly. I mean, there's just by the nature of the domain itself, there are specific requirements that would need to be implemented, even at the highest abstract level. So what what kind of technical challenge there? So you, I guess, it is not that different compared to other uh, scenarios, right? Yeah, in principle, there, there's the wide, I mean, there are, there are unique challenges for the legal aspects of this, but there are also common challenges to, to this approach as well that um, include, you know, just, just compiling down to different types of distributed ledgers, uh, languages, uh, compatibility and so forth, but um, there there are some unique aspects that we're you know that's the sort of the purpose of the project is to solve the legal issues uh, surrounding smart contracts. Let me try to ask or uh, follow up on Bauer's question. I mean, do you expect this will drive extensions to the framework you're going to build on? Like in case of Composer, I know Dan is part of this, is very familiar with the Composer. Uh, do you, does, is that already driving some additional requirements for Composer and maybe even Fabric? Yes, that, that's correct. We, we do plan on adding some additional um, components or aspects to the, the existing um, 
Mali languages that, that relate specifically to the legal aspects. So you may have, you know, broad concepts like transaction or asset um, in one approach, but um, connecting those to a legally enforceable transaction or a contract and maybe providing for remedies if there is an issue is, is part of what uh, the protocol will be establishing. So you, you want to uh, make the Cicero uh, to focus on the uh, legal contract area or you want to make it more general? Um, it's, it is for legal, the, the legal contract area, specifically. So I have another question. This is Arno again. I mean, what's the relationship today between the Accord and Hyperledger? Accord is a an associate member of Hyperledger. Okay. As a, as a nonprofit open source organization. All right. That's that's what I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe a bit of background. So the Accord project is a is a nonprofit. Um, consortium that was developed to that was formed to develop standards specifically for legal contracts. It's it's technology neutral and um, and open source. So the purpose is ultimately to take standards that are developed by uh, lawyers and whether law firm, in house counsel, and technologists and and uh, people in business that, that deal with contracts, uh, develop the standards, establish them, and then ultimately implement them in an open source. Software and Cicero is one sort of um, implementation of that project uh, as a hyperledger top level project. So, who, who, so who else is a member of Accord? I'm just curious. Yeah, we have uh, a wide variety of members, including. Um, Numerous attorneys, um, larger companies are getting onboarded, uh, startups, and we are we we have partners partnerships with organizations existing and pending as well, including the International Association for Contracts and Commercial Management, which is a a uh, itself a nonprofit um, trade association for the essentially the contract management industry. Um, besides, can you just make the proposal commendable? I, I see I cannot add any comment there. Okay. Yes. Hey, so I had a question that I put in chat. Um, I think this is a really cool idea, but uh, what's the reason why you guys want to do this separately from the Composer project rather than just kind of have it as a module of Composer? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think that there's there's enough going on here that would warrant a, a separate project at Hyperledger. And I think that, you know, there's enough interest uh, throughout the community that and, and would be eventually um, used by enough people that I think a project makes sense. It also doesn't seem to be defined by being a composer plugin or module, but but more it one of its ways of being expressed or being supported is through composer. Like it seems like yeah, that, there could be ways right. to support it in other tooling. Right, that's correct. If you wouldn't mind, I think it would find it helpful if, uh, like in an academic paper where there's a related work section, if if there was some way that you could. Uh, help describe the Accord project in the context of similar efforts that are out there. I think there's a couple other um, projects around trying to formalize legal language into coding language. And so I think that would help us understand the, the relative merits of building around this approach versus another one. Sure. Happy to do that. <clears throat> yeah, so I I think, you know, the the one question that I, you know, have and I think others 
pardon me as well is so how do we get access to this protocol spec because i think that's uh, i i think that that would have to be public before we can really be starting to work on this otherwise it's it's not clear to me how anyone could start to contribute if they didn't actually know what the spec was right um, sure that makes sense and uh, we'll follow up with that Are there, uh, I mean, aside from the affinity to Composer and the discussion we just had, other questions, concerns about potentially incubating this? Uh, this, this Brian, I'll say, you know, even though this is earlier than uh, most projects that we've considered for incubation, um, I think there's upside to it starting uh, life uh, as a hyperledger project versus being brought in later, just that it, it you know, it helps build a, an even broader stakeholder community, I think. Um, uh, but, but yeah, it has to, I think it, for us to, to essentially endorse the standard kind of in the way that same way we endorse the interledger standard, we have to have confidence that the process by which that standard is built um, is, is open enough that, you know, developers who show up on this project can also participate in the development of that standard. Um, I right. do like the fact it was named differently. Um, that was the, you know, coming up with Quilt was a minor stroke of genius. I, I forget who that was. I think it was uh, Arno um, or somebody. Um, but uh, I like the fact that Cicero is named differently. So naming police are happy over here. Right. <clears throat> so my question uh, would still be in the also, you know, related to the relationship I'm still trying to understand in terms of controls. So how much influence can the hyperledger community have over the spec, for instance? What does it take if you know I'm a I'm a contributor, I join, I'm excited about the project, I join the community, but I feel like the spec is not quite right, and I want to comment on the spec and maybe part, become part of. I mean, what does it take to be a member of this organization, essentially? Yeah, if you're talking about the core project, um, yeah, we're a membership-based organization and it's generally open for people to join and then we have various committees, um, whether they're sort of subject matter specific or working groups that is, that can contribute to their sort of um, pieces of the protocol as, as may be relevant. Then we have sort of more general working groups like, uh, like uh, data standards and so forth that would, that would apply to legal contracts generally. And, and certainly there's room for input either through the core project or through you know uh, feedback on Cicero specifically through Hyperledger. But when you say it's open, do you have to be a member to join? I mean, like, you know, Hyperledger has membership, but anybody can participate. Like these calls are completely open and right. all the projects are completely open, whether you're a member officially or not. Yeah, we we may need to further define that, but it's it's open in that in that similar fashion as well. Okay, thank you. Any other? Uh, yeah, I'll just say that uh, um, I, I I guess two things. I mean, think I'll I'll re-echo Hart's comment um that he put in the, the original the message reply which was it'd be nice to be able to put comments in the in the proposal because i have you know just sort of looking through it in a little more detail now i've got several other questions that are specific mm -hmm. to that i think i'd also like to see um this in the context of um uh, what else is going on out there and I, i'm still struggling a little bit with exactly what it means to fit into these others you know how do how do I how do I conceive of this? Do I conceive of it as an interpreter? Do I conceive of it as an orchestrator? Um, I, I, and and without that sort of background, I'm having a hard time seeing how it fits into. Um, you know, again, is it really just an extension of composer if it's an orchestrator? So. Yep, I think okay. that yeah, I think that's fair. And again, I, I think I, you know, I think as a legal underpinning, um, what is usually happened in the past, meaning the people who have attempted to do this uh, in other venues have usually attached a actual legal document 
or at least a hash of it into the blockchain to um, confirm that this is the master. Like for example, for an exchange, uh, for an asset issuance, for a transaction, these are the master contacts that uh, that define the uh, exchange. And if there are any um, bugs in the actual code, yeah. then the master contract would override it, and it would be the dispute would be settled outside the blockchain. In other words, code is not the law. The law is the law, and the code is you know, operates most of the time independently. So in terms of the uh, structure uh, of the blockchain itself and the infrastructure of the blockchain, uh, it would be possibly, uh, you know, there would be attachments in terms of the documents uh, that are generate, I mean, I don't know how far we can take this, whether a, uh, a, a defined legal contract uh, which is not from a template can be used to automatically generate smart contract code that is yet to be seen, but um, maybe if it is driven towards a specific template for a specific product, that's why the ISDA is doing it for specific products. For a generic products, it is a little more difficult because uh, you have to come up with a, you know, like in every product exchange, there would be uh, already uh, laws or certain attributes governing the product. So once you fill that in, then it would generate both a uh, contract and a smart contract uh, from that. Uh, you, you know, that that's right. said, normally yeah, that's the process of these kind of uh, uh, frameworks. Yeah. Understood. That's certainly that's certainly uh, a an, an issue we are uh, dealing with. I, I think quite well, but understood. So we, we can further define the the generic genericity of, of our approach too. Okay. Um, by the way, two, two two notes kind of that are related. One, you know, for example, ISDA, right? When when I was a bank and we had the ISDA kind of spec basically for CDSs, and we worked to standardize it after the credit crisis. We still had different implementations, right? JV Morgan at the time open source the CDS pricer and said, oh, you know, this is compliant with the ESDA kind of spec, but no no bank actually used it. Like we all implemented our own, which was faster, et cetera. So even when we had a spec, nobody agreed on the implementation, right? So it's similar to what Pippin is saying. You have the law, you have the recommendations, you have the spec, you have the terminology, but then you have different implementations, right? So we, we should think about it. Second question that maybe, maybe the first one was not really a question, just a comment. I don't, I don't understand why the website says that the code project is built in partnership with Hyperledger. Is, is it the case or I, I don't understand that? It states in, in partnership with Hyperledger. Yeah, the, the partnership what that refers to our, it refers to us being an associate member of Hyperledger in the, in that, so not like a legal partnership, in, but a, 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 um, a partnership just in the sense that we're a member. An associate member. Okay. Yeah, I, say, I, I don't know. I, say, I think maybe you should clarify it on the website. Yeah. So here, here's what I would suggest um, so that we can move on with the agenda. I would suggest that, again, as I think multiple people have requested to open up the Google Doc so that it can be commented um, and um, that we then take this to the mailing list and the comment thread and um, and then we can pick it up again next week. But again, I think, you know, from 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 my perspective, I think, you know, if we're going to do this, then I think that the spec has to be published before we incubate this. Um, again, I just okay. don't see how you start a project without actually having a foundation to build from. Do, so, do you mean published in final form or draft form? Uh, it can be draft, but it can be it needs to be public. <laughs> Can't be a secret, is what I'm, I'm saying. Sure, we'll get that up in short order. All right. Excellent. Um, well, thank, thank you. Yeah. So thanks, Luman and and Dan. So um, uh, next up, I can't remember. <laughs> uh, was it uh, Sawtooth? <laughs> is it Sawtooth that's up next on the agenda? 
Uh, the, the sorry, sorry, Tracy's up. Okay. Tracy, Training and Education Working Group. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So, um, went through the, the comments that were uh, existing in the document, uh, the charter as it was put together, uh, and addressed some of those. So, the, as the first uh, topic, people want education added to the, the name of the working group. So, it's now the Training and Education Working Group. Um, the second piece was that uh, Bawal Bo Bo um, asked about whether we would be producing materials in this working group or um, holding training events. And so the, um, the answer is that we would be providing materials that could be used by others. And then this uh, material could be used uh, by others to conduct their training courses. So I added in the scope just kind of that uh, information to make sure that it was reflected that we would be open sourcing uh, the material that we were creating using obviously the licenses that are part of the Hyperledger Charter and that the material would be open for others to use uh, in their training courses. Uh, the next piece was around uh, whether or not the working group would produce be producing the products or collecting them from uh, project developers or both. Um, so obviously I think it could be both, but I'd, I want the group uh, to be autonomous and develop the material that seems to be needed or required by the, the people who are looking for educational material. So um, I didn't really make any changes to the document based on that. I, I just left kind of the, the work products as is. Um, obviously, you know, if there's some place that makes sense to put that information, we can, can do that. Um, around whether or not projects already have videos and self-paced training. Um, I don't think they do. Um, obviously, there was a lot of requests for the MOOC that we just released on edX uh, for the introduction to Hyperledger Technologies. Uh, more than 16,000 people signed up for it before it even started. So um, people are really desperate to get information about blockchain and Hyperledger. Uh, and so I think, you know, we need to make sure that we're, um, we've got this group that can, can put that together. Uh, and then uh, the last, uh, well, there's a couple more comments. Still, we, we need to figure out, like, who the maintainers are. Um, so right now, we do have an education uh, re repo that we've put the um, first Hyperledger MOOC kind of source code into. Uh, and so far, uh, I am a maintainer and Rai is a maintainer, but, but uh, we, we obviously need to figure out who the correct maintainers are for this. And then the last comment was whether or not we could leverage existing MOOC platforms uh, or create a new one for Hyperledger. So what, um, what we've done, obviously, for the first one is use edX because the Linux Foundation has um, a number of training courses that they offer through edX. And so... Um, if it makes sense for us to offer uh, additional MOOCs on edX, I think that would be the direction that we would want to head. So that's that's kind of addressing the comments that exist. Uh, open to other comments or feedback that now that people have had kind of a, a chance to, to review it and think about it, and, and we can um, decide how to go forward with this. Yeah, so I'm still sort of... Um, I'm still struggling, and 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 Hart had a great comment in the chat. What saint is going to, you know, what saints are going to be the maintainers for this? Um, I think that, you know, I'm still struggling a little bit with, um, you know, getting the right people to make sure that the content is correct. Um, you know, again, I don't want to get in the way of people wanting to make contributions and do stuff that is always, you know, welcome. But I do think that, you know, when we're putting together training and education material or videos or whatever, that, you know, if, uh, you know, if we're doing Sawtooth that Mick or Dan or somebody has had an opportunity or, or Sean has had an opportunity to, to basically review that and give it, the hamana hamana that allows it to go forward. If 
then if we're saying that we're requiring that, you know, Mick or Dan or, or somebody, you know, from Sawtooth and somebody from Fabric, you know, then the question becomes, okay, so how does that, uh, you know, how does that actually work? If you're just saying, well, you know, two maintainers need to review it, but, you know, if you have two maintainers from Aroha reviewing the fabric, is that really, is it correct? Or is it just, you know, there were no typos, right? So I, I'm, I'm still struggling a little bit with how we, we, we make sure that this, you know, the material that's produced is, is correct and without necessarily asking a maintainer from another project to be a maintainer on, uh, on this repo. And, yeah. and we talked about, I... well, let me just finish my, so, but we did talk about maybe the material is actually part of the other project um, and, um, uh, and, and it may even, you know, be maintained in a repository that's either part of the other project or whatever. And the working group is really just providing the, um, uh, you know, is, is, is providing the, the input, the insight, the, you know, um, the best practices and potentially even, you know, the effort into building it, but it's, you know, it's, it's part of that, that project. And then therefore the maintainers, you know, they're the ones that were responsible for uh, merging any, any, any commits, you know, any, any PRs or whatever. And, but that, that falls into the normal process that those projects have, <clears throat> if that makes sense. I think, I, I think this is a, problem that answers itself over time. Um, I think both, uh, uh, yes, we w I would hope that the code projects do have somebody who decides to join as a maintainer and be active on such a project to serve as a bridge. In the absence of such a person, I don't think this working group would push out content that they had not validated you know, because um, nobody, <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to step in and, and um, you know, be, try to pretend to be an expert in something they don't know about. So I think, I mean, just as we found when we were developing the content for this course the first time around, um, both sides knew that this was important. Um, and, uh, I, you know, and so we've, we got engagement from each of the Fabric and Sawtooth and Aroha teams to develop uh, that content. Uh, and I expect the same kind of thing. Either, you, you know, folks from the different projects join officially and, and they see themselves as emissaries. And I think there are many who are coders, but not quite at the technical depth of maybe many of the core coders who see this as a good way for them to contribute. Uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, um, and I think there'll be a lot of new, new, uh, new faces as well who'll come into the community because they can contribute in this way. Um, thinking of other educators, other companies that lead training, um, uh, you know, and even even university professors and students. I think this is the kind of interesting project for them because they don't have to be a core developer. They don't have to know a lot about the guts of the code to be able to contribute meaningfully to a project like this. Um, so I, I I think it's a self-limiting issue, but um, uh, certainly certainly making sure that the projects know that <laughs> this is here and they and they and if they got involved, that would lead to higher quality content um, would be would be ideal. I know most project most problems that I run into in life, I, I like to just let them solve themselves. That usually works out well for me. It's great. They do. Great. <laughs> so as as I was thinking about this uh, this week, and I didn't get around to drafting an email about it, but it it started to strike me as it was the idea was being presented kind of like a project where we need people with that kind of educator or, or um, presentation skill set to talk about the projects in a way that maybe somebody with a developer skill set can't. Um, and if it, if we were gonna look at this like a project proposal, then we would see, you know, who are the resources that are assigned to this? And are they people that are capable of delivering that project? And I think maybe that's one of the things that, that, that I'm a little bit hung up on is, it's not clear to me who, who's actually going to be developing the content and if it's, you know, maybe this is a, a way to try to 
course some some content out of the the project teams that, that isn't being created but I, I i don't think that's really the the intent that's being described yeah so dan i i have had a lot of people who are um wanting to get involved in this working group um that have reached out to me after they've seen this and said you know hey let me know when this actually happens because i'm really interested in participating um so you know i maybe it would help if all of those people kind of um respond to the the proposal and say you know like this is this is a working group i want to be part of i i just i don't want to limit who participates right i don't want to say oh only only these people are allowed to participate in this working group because i think that people regardless of um their level of expertise uh will bring a different set of perspectives to the the working group right and and those pers perspectives could actually make the training much more valuable for others um and so you know i i'm not sure like um you know, it seems that there's concern about who's going to be involved in this, um, but I'm, I'm not sure that I know how to deal with those concerns. So, so Tracy, just to be clear, because I have no concern with who's involved in it. I do have concern over when the material is deemed final or releasable or what have you, and who's reviewed it. Does that... I mean, th there's a clear distinction there. I mean, uh, you know, to your point, I think there are people who bring, um, you know, either a more uh, education background or presentation background or in a teaching background, what have you, and they have, you know, there's certain skills involved in how you actually communicate around a technology and not all developers in fact most developers don't have those skills right so totally but my point again is but we still want to make sure that when we do put this material out that those who worked to build it agree with the content um, and without necessarily having to have them fully engaged and involved through the whole process because well they have a job to do too and uh, you know, again, you know, as, as Hart said in his original comment, which saints are going to to do this? This is, you know, it's asking people to step up and do more, and uh, and and that's always a challenge, right? But I do think that if we're getting to a point where we have, uh, you know, let's say we're putting together a presentation that's going to talk about how transaction families works. That we get Sean and 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 Dan to review it, and that that's part of the process. That we make sure that there's an advisor, maybe chosen at the beginning of a of a of an uh, you know of a sub project or whatever you want to call it, to do some piece of training or education material or what have you, and then there's a process for making sure that that's reviewed at the end. Okay, do, I mean, are there people who are like volunteering to be that advisor? I, I, I mean, I, I can't pick the advisors, right? They have to be interested in actually doing that work, right? I, so we, we actually, you know, if, if the process is that an advisor has to approve or a set of advisors has to approve, um, then we need to know who those advisors are. Um, well, but I think it's going to depend on you guys decide you want to do, you know, transaction family training, then you would go to Dan or to Sean or, you know, one of the maintainers of Sawtooth and say, who can we have review this at the end? That's not hard. I mean, that's, I mean, and, you know, similarly for the other projects as well. You go to the project maintainers and you ask. I, I mean, again, I think, you know, it's, it's one thing to be fully engaged and involved in every meeting of the, the education work group. And it's another thing to be, um, uh, you know, sort of have a touch point and involved where it's relevant 
to your particular domain and where you can be adding specific value, but maybe you don't have time to do all, you know, to participate throughout the, the life cycle of the, the working group. I think maybe what we should do is um, go back and develop uh, the roster of maintainers um, uh, and, and people who would be actually attached to this project and aim for, I mean, I'm, I'm saying offline outside the context of this call, go and try to recruit for this um, because it feels to me like if you saw a initial set of committed maintainers who represented, you know, um, all or, or most of the projects uh, at Hyperledger, um, that would address address many of these concerns about it not being disconnected or or you know a new group of uh, uh, people with no connection to the existing project or code or or anything like that. Um, would that would that be helpful? Yeah, I think it would be helpful. Um, I I I think um, maybe I didn't really quite understand. I mean the the roster of maintainers is. And, and maybe we just do need to make that a little bit more visible, but most projects put it in a maintainer's file, right? So, um, yeah, and we hadn't done that here, I think, on the hope that, that this process would, would create some volunteers, unless, Tracy, I'm missing that. You're, you're not missing that line. Okay. If, if you guys could excuse oh. my ignorance for, for a minute, um, how do we deal with documentation? Is documentation tied to specific projects and ships when the project ships, or is that an independent group as well? There is no independent documentation group at the moment. Because it almost, Left to you know, I, it, it would seem that if someone's developing a training for fabric or a course for fabric, then, you know, they clearly need to be tied to the fabric project to some degree. So the current well, I mean, that's, fabric was developed without without um, without that. I uh, and I mean, there's a lot of checking in though to make sure hey, is this on the right course? Is this the right kind of thing? Uh, so so that that happens organically, um, but uh, uh, we definitely need somebody involved with fabric yet at at the very least it, uh, the tail end of that process. But it, I did earlier, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, so so there was an example fairly recently where um, an individual who is not directly involved in the development of Fabric, um, but was uh, a user. And in order to better understand the platform, he built a number of samples. And, and then he sent a note to the mailing list saying, hey, I've developed a number of samples as part of my work to try and understand. And what do you think? And we all thought that in, well, I thought, I think a couple other people weighed in and thought that, well, these are great, you know, and if he wanted to contribute them, that he should look to maybe do that. And, you know, but then that's, again, if if it does come under the Hyperledger umbrella, so to speak, then it would get, you know, the review of the people that are maintainers on the fabric samples, right? Um, and, you know, if there's errors or whatever, they are going to get addressed. And if, you know, if they're good, they're good. Um, but that's fabric, right? And this, this, you know, this is where I, you know, sort of fundamentally think that, yes, there are going to be individuals who want to contribute, who want to help work on improving the material that we have to communicate the technologies that we're building here, whether it's fabric or sawtooth or roja, burrow, indie, whatever. Um, and we love them to do that. But again, I do think that we just need that, what is the process then to go and get somebody to come and review it to make sure that it's correct? Um, and and, and I, I think that, you know, you know, just, you know, we could, we could run it by the TSC, but the TSC doesn't necessarily have individuals as a member of the TSC who are maintainers on cello or, you know, what have you, right? Well, we do, but... <laughs> Could you, Chris, could you draft something that describes kind of what you'd be looking for? And we can maybe make that part of next week's conversation. Okay. Because I don't know that I, I would be concerned at over specifying how that works. And then we end up well, with lots I, of I, conversation I, about what is essentially a process detail once the, that can be hammered out once the group is created. So, I, 
you know, and, Brian, and Chris, I, come. I think this is actually pretty straightforward. I'm just saying that, look, if the working group comes out and they want to publish something and say that this is done, that the process is that they go to the project that's relevant and they ask for somebody to do a technical review for correctness. It, it's simple. And, and they get feedback and they fix it or they publish it. It's I don't I don't I'm, I'm not trying to make it a big process. I'm just trying to say where where is that? That's not documented in this proposal. That's my point. I, it, um, I think we all agree that creating the training materials is a valuable exercise and we should have and finding resources to help us who are trained in developing that material is a good thing. So I don't, I think that's not, that's not the issue. Um, I, I, Brian, I hear what you say about, you know, let's um, sort of figure this out. And I would feel a lot more comfortable. Um, it, just a proposal for now is why don't we just go develop the first set of material for the first set of material. We focus on TSC approval and have this discussion again when we have a concrete piece of collateral that we can talk about who should have approved that and then develop the process from there. It, it, it feels like we're being really prescriptive about something we really don't know about and that's that's kind of causing a lot of the conflict right now. Okay, I mean, we've created that, it's up on edX now, um, and we, we could schedule a future conversation to talk about how that process worked, uh, who was involved in that, um, and you know how much should that serve as a template going forward or be adjusted going forward. I, I would feel a lot more comfortable about having that in a very concrete, with a, with a piece of collateral that we can talk about that roots, it, roots the conversation a little bit more. I mean, it just feels like, it, I'm all in favor of the proposal as is right now, I, you know, because I think we the, the value of generating the material is high enough that we should be moving forward. Um, I, I also understand this sort of concern about, you know, don't release something unless the, the don't release something about a project unless the people in the project have had um, uh, some opportunity to review it. Um, and yeah, okay, so it's on edX. That's great. So bring it in here and let's review the very specific content that's been done, not for the purpose of reviewing the content, but for reviewing who should be the ones that are um, kind of in the in the loop for for approving. That is run it through as kind of a, a straw man proposal process. And I guess that's sort of where I was trying to get to is, you know, what's the approval for documentation? You know, does, does training material need to be any different? Um, okay, we could do that. I was uh, more fond of the idea that I was coming back with a set of maintainers that the TSE could trust to do this work. Um, and uh, if the TSE wants to, I mean, this is, this, this is a lot more time investment by the TSC, um, but if, uh, uh, you know, if we want to do that on these calls in the future, we can, we, you know, we can do well, that. Um, it, it, feels like, it feels like there's a, you know, there is work on, on the proposal side to do to identify those maintainers, and if they were familiar names, I think the TSC would be comfortable delegating that task to those names. Um, but if, uh, and I was hoping that this proposal would engender some more volunteers, because clearly it's, it's a passionate topic for many folks, and I don't think this ends up being a, a lot of extra work for, for, for the tier of people who would be uh, talking about how this works and how it gets approved. Um, uh, and it would be a way to bring in more uh, contributors as well to try to scale up. So it's not so much asking more from, from sm a small group, but more opportunity from a larger group, for a larger group to participate. Um, so uh, if we come back with uh, an amendment to this, which lists maintainers, uh, maybe that's the, the thing to talk about next week or the week after. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Um, we have two minutes for Dan, so we don't have two minutes for Dan, unfortunately. <laughs> Everything is wonderful. It's. <laughs> we should. And, and I think we should do these project updates closer to the beginnings of agendas yeah, um, uh, in the future. Okay. 
right? Um, so apologies, Dan. So we'll get to you next week. Um, uh, and we also have, what, Aroha, I think, next week. So we'll try and put those both up in the beginning talk. Will do. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Good discussion. Um, and um, I guess we'll take the discussion of the working group and the uh, and Cicero to the mailing list and to the comment threads. Uh, and we'll see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye.